So I have the honor of introducing our panelists. So all the way uh, to my right is Dr. Todd C. Helmus, who's a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation. He specializes in terrorism, strategic communications, and social media. His work focuses on improving U.S. efforts to counter militant recruitment and decrease popular support for terrorism and insurgency. He has examined the networks of ISIS supporters and opponents on Twitter and identified ways to enlist key influencers in support of U.S. strategic communications. He has identified approaches to assess CVE uh, campaigns as well. Um, he's worked closely with U.S. Special Operation Forces in Afghanistan, where he served as an advisor to U.S. commanders and led studies on U.S. efforts to train the Afghan Special Security Forces. Uh, in 2008, he also served in Baghdad as an advisor to the multinational forces of Iraq. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from Wayne State University. Next is Cheryl Frank, who had joined the Institute for Security Studies in 2009 as the director of the Pretoria office. She's currently the head of trans Transnational Threats and International Crime Program in Pretoria. Before joining the ISS, Cheryl was executive director at child rights organization RAPCAN, director of the Criminal Justice Initiative at the Open Society Foundation for South Africa, research and program director at APCOF, and researcher at the Institute of Criminology, University of Cape Town. She began her career as a social worker with the National Institute for Crime and the Rehabilitation of Offenders. Cheryl has a Bachelor of Social Science, Social Work degree from the University of Natal, and an MBA from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And sitting next to me is Dr. Matthew Levitt, who is the Fromer Wexler Fellow and the director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policies, Jeanette and Eli Reinhard Program on Counterterrorism counter and Intelligence. Dr. Levitt has written extensively on terrorism, on countering violent extremism, illicit finance, sanctions, the Middle East, Arab-Israeli peace negotiations, with articles appearing in peer-reviewed journals, policy magazines, the press, including Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and numerous other publications. So I have very esteemed colleagues joining us on the stage today, um, and this is probably just a snapshot of many of their accolades. So throughout the day today, I hope we have helped sharpen why we think it was a pretty good idea back in September of 2015 for international stakeholders to launch the Resolve Network. The idea of connecting, capturing, and curating locally informed research on violent extremism and how it can promote effective policy and practice is a worthy endeavor. Almost three years after its inception and with a commitment to clarify its mission and its practice, this year's Resolve Forum is designed to push the envelope a little bit further on addressing what are our knowledge gaps on violent extremism, as well as the gaps in between research and how it influences policymaking. I'm hoping that our panel here can unpack some of the very real experiences of experts well-versed in the CVE ecosystem <clears throat> on research to policy conversations, and hopefully what we can do about improving our community of practice going forward. <clears throat> so we're gonna start, I'm just going to have a little bit of an informal opening and ask each of the panelists to give opening remarks, and then we'll go to a couple of questions. So we'll start with Todd, please. All right, well, thank you. Um, I, was, I was intrigued when you sent the email describing what uh, some of Topics you wanted to address, noting that part of the question is like, what are the challenges in seamlessly integrating research into practice? And I find it a, a I, I'd laugh a little bit because I've n never had good luck seamlessly <laughs> integrating research into practice, and it's so hard on multiple levels. Um, uh, some ways by design, and just some ways just with the difficultiness of the topic we're looking at. I mean, number one, there's in general a disconnect between policymakers and academics. Um, from my experience, academics oftentimes struggle to understand what the policymakers need, what their actual research needs are, and even at RAND, where we oftentimes work very closely with the policymakers, at least the shop that's you know, funding whatever work we're doing, even then it's really hard to get a good understanding of what the policymaker wants, what is their decision point, and how are you trying to inform that. Um, just CVE research in general is just a very messy process. Getting access to subjects is hard. The research that we do, rarely has, like, gives you a 100% variance answer on anything. So pretty much anybody can criticize most research on <coughs> terrorism because there's loopholes and flaws and everything. 
Um, so in some senses, researchers really just need to, provide, they're trying to provide part of an answer. Rarely do you ever provide a full or a comprehensive answer. Um, and oftentimes there's not much on the back end. So as researchers finish their research products up, oftentimes, at least from my experience, we spend all our money doing the research. We have spent very little time and money and effort interacting with the policymakers to push our products. We hope that by providing a 100 page report on the website that somehow will magically influence <laughs> people and I'm shocked that it doesn't. <laughs> um, and, and the policy process is hard, right? There's a lot of stakeholders involved in all sorts of decisions and rarely does the researcher get 100% vote on anything. They probably shouldn't, right? But, um, there's a lot of stakeholders to include the general public that has a say in these things. So anyway, I think it's really hard to have this seamless integration. I think there's ways to address all of those factors, but it's a, it's a bit of a slog. Um, and I can't think of any home runs that I've had in my work. Um, I'm waiting for the day, but I trust that over time, um, bit by answering questions, um, at least answering part of the question continually, you know, that starts to get a good chunk of it addressed. So. And Cheryl, what are your thoughts on a similar question? Um, yeah, you know, if, if you would have uh, listened carefully to Leanne's description of my bio, <laughs> is that um, you know, my entire career has been moving around all these uh, spaces of being in practice as a social worker and then running an NGO, um, working in research institutes at universities, and now my kind of hybrid job of doing research and then capacity building and technical assistance in Africa and uh, and my experiences are in Africa um, and then uh, and then also acting as an advocate for certain human rights issues and and particularly in the child rights field so um, you know I've been maneuvering around the space trying to uh, find my way um, and find where is it that we can make the the most significant change is it in practice is it in research is it in uh, influencing policy so my entire career is the search for has been a search for these sorts of answers but um, I think what, you know, the main thing that I struggle with currently is these three pieces of things, which is one is evidence, the other piece is policy and what is in policy and the other piece is actual, actual practices. And the huge gaping holes between all those things and how they, they relate to each other. So, um, and how they communicate with each other and how one may have something stick on another, such as uh, in Africa, uh, we have this, I mean, I, I'm South African, so uh, even, and my career started in South Africa, we used to call this, this problem implementitis, is that we had the most fantastic policies straight after apartheid, and we had the most brilliant pieces, we have a brilliant constitution, we had all these brilliant pieces of legislation supported by the world. Um, and we just couldn't make it happen in many places in, in very, uh, with very disastrous results for children, for families, for women, um, which is the field that I worked in at the time. So um, this implementitis problem and in between policy and practice at the time and then um, and then as a researcher, as I developed, noticing the, the massive gaping hole again between evidence and the other two, other two things, policy and practice again. Um, and uh, the sort of triangle of things that was confused and uh, really difficult to figure out how they linked to each other. So. Um, um, I remember, and, and I'll, I'll just end my opening comments with this, is I remember um, we were preparing as a group, as an alliance of organizations to go to the South African Parliament to have South Africa's first uh, juvenile justice legislation passed. So we'd been working on this for years and we're taking this to Parliament and like a good Research, as I suppose I went to poke around in the data on, you know, how does, um, how much do parliamentarians actually listen to evidence? Because we were preparing submissions to present to parliament around 
around these issues. Um, and um, I, I sort of was depressed for about three or four days after that because there was a lot of evidence coming out of the UK, um, particularly in, in terms of their overseas development assistance um, analyses about how little it was happening. And I see the same things over and over again. I looked again yesterday when preparing for Leanne's uh, comments and noted exactly the same problem. So, um, so it's really a question, I think, again, of <coughs> this communication issue between these three spheres, spheres of existence. And, and is it a practical communication issue, I wonder? Um, and it, it's what you were talking about. Is, is it the 18 page, 80 page report on the, on, the web, <laughs> on the website that is the communication problem? <laughs> and is that part of the problem? Or is it a, you know, a bigger dynamic that we have to address? And, and I suspect it is the latter. And over to you, Matt. <laughs> So first of all, I think that uh, one of the uh, measures of success uh, you should use is how many times it's been downloaded, not how many times it's been read. Um, I personally got to page 80, but no, not past that. Um, if anybody uh, wants my business card, I'm happy to give it. That's one of my measures of success. How often do I have to replenish my, my business cards? And you laugh, but that's a little bit how we tend to measure some of these programs. Um, and uh, at the Washington Institute, I, I lead a, a CVE a working group uh, with some wonderful people involved. <laughs> um, and uh, we talk about these things. And then I've also led now three different uh, bipartisan study groups, uh, three with different reports that we publish. They're all available on our website. And you can download them from my metrics. I'd, I'd appreciate that very much. <laughs> um, and in that, we, we uh, brought together, we're a nonpartisan think tank, but we brought together Democrats and Republicans, put together this report, and then we kind of walked it into policymakers' offices. And I want to give you a little bit of feedback from that. Mm. Uh, the first point is that uh, in this country, we don't have a political system that allows for failure, okay? So uh, I give our European counterparts, for example, tremendous kudos for trying and failing and trying again. Uh, lots of people like to beat up on, on the Brits for their various iterations of their contest uh, strategy. Fair enough. But they have tried and continue trying and don't always succeed. And I'd like to see a little bit more of that in this country. But we don't have on either side of the aisle, we don't have a political system that tolerates much of that. So I walked into uh, various uh, House and Senate committees and met with members and staff with Democrats and Republicans from our task force. And we briefed them on a whole bunch of these different issues. And ultimately, they'd come down and they'd say, well, why should I fund any of these programs if I don't know that they're going to work? And we said, you won't know what will work until you fund something and you build metrics and evaluation into it and you can limit it and then, then we'll have something more to talk about. They only saw it from the political perspective of you're asking me in a very, very sensitive area. We're talking about terrorism here, right? To, to take a risky stance um, and if you can imagine how risky it is at the front end when you're talking about off-ramping people who haven't necessarily committed any crimes yet but seem to be inclined to go down a wrong path, you can imagine how much more sensitive it is for an era where we are going to need to spend a lot more time and effort on the back end as people uh, finish serving their terms in prison, for example, and come out of prison. And as you heard this morning, there are no, not, not no effective, there are no re-entry programs to help people uh, be able to, to re-enter society. Which brings me to my next point. Very often, uh, policymakers in this country on both sides of the aisle come at this through a very ideological lens from both sides of the aisle. Um, and that is to say there are many people who feel uncomfortable putting in place, as several people have put it to me, uh, social welfare programs for terrorists. That, that's not how we deal with terrorists, right? Our, our purpose here is not to embrace terrorists before or after. Uh, we have other ways to deal with them. Um, that is extremely short-sighted. I said to one person, um, you know, um, we have programs for rehabilitation for people who carry out all kinds of really heinous, horrible crimes. This, the T word, becomes so emotional and so political uh, and so ideological that somehow we put it in a completely different context. 
every administration that comes uh, into the White House um, has a period of policy review. That's always the case. The policy review for uh, what I still call CVE policy, but the Trump administration now calls terrorism prevention, has taken about <laughs> until now. And the pendulum is just now beginning to come back into the larger middle after what was a very ideological discussion, mostly about radical Islamism, when that is not what this is actually about, and that's only, if anything, a small, small piece of it. Um, and so I think that there is an opportunity now to have some of the discussions that have come up over the course of today, and that may surprise some people. Um, but I think that that's good. The, the downside is that for many people, this is an ideological issue. For example, some members of the task force that we put together really didn't like it when we wanted to talk about domestic terrorism, white supremacist violence. Uh, that conversation has changed post Charlottesville, but at the time people said to me, and these are smart, smart, great people, We've had those problems in the United States for years. That's not new. What's new is the radical Islamist terrorism that's coming from abroad. So we have this ideological piece too. I think we need to think of this also, however, not only from the inside the beltway, federal and legislative perspective, we need to think about this at a local and state level. Not only because I think we are seeing now that there is more headway in CVE programs domestically here in the United States, and I should say that's, that's my area of focus more CVE domestically than internationally, um, but because ultimately these are phenomena that are happening in communities, and the communities are those that are best placed to have, an, have a, a sense of what they need. You know, people in, in within the Beltway here talk about the need to give dollars to federal, state and local law enforcement to deal with terrorism. But if you go out and you talk to local law enforcement across the country, most of those jurisdictions, they want to deal with opioid problems. They want to deal with a high murder rate. It's not that they're soft on terrorism. That's just not something that's part of their regular lives. And if you come say, and you need to spend 15, 20, 25, 30% of your budget on counterterrorism, that's, that's out of left field for them. So I spoke to some of the people who lead the core initiative here uh, in Maryland, some of whom, Shana Batten Aguirre and others have been here. I don't know if they're still here. I think Shan had to go pick up her kids at school. <laughs> um, to talk about how some of these issues of metrics and evaluation fit into how they actually run programs in communities. And one of the things I heard is that there is MINE PhD fatigue enough with you PhDs coming and telling us all the different boxes we have to check. When we are running programs in communities, we have to deal with the communities themselves, and we have to deal with the local and state government, mostly law enforcement, with which we need to interact. The local and state government doesn't want to know all about the PhD-isms. What they want to know is, how can I fit this into existing programs? Because you're not giving me more money to run these things. All right, budgets are limited. How can I fit this into things I'm doing already? And when you go to the communities, they don't want you to come with a bunch of big terminologies and big ideas and tell them, we've studied it, here's what you're experiencing. <laughs> what they want is to be asked. And so, you know, the collective impact methodology, where you come in and you say, hey, we've done some studies, and we have a sense of what's going on, but we'd like your opinion. Here's, here's what we think. Is this what you're experiencing in community? Is, is there something different? And there you get, you get basic buy-in. And the last thing, which is an area of tremendous disconnect with federal government, with legislature, et cetera, is that across the board, I haven't spoken to every program there's across the country, but every spoke, program I have spoken to unanimously says it is tremendously unhelpful to put this into terms of terrorism or any type of ideology. To the extent we can put this in terms of public safety, to the extent we can put this in terms of violence prevention, which ultimately is what this is about, we will inherently get much more community buy-in. And a lot of people here in the Beltway don't like that. And you will notice that under this administration, this effort in most, not all, but most federal agencies and departments is now referred to as terrorism prevention, which I think is undermining the ability to run exactly the same type of programs we're talking about in communities who don't want it to only be about the big T word. Ultimately, what we're talking about is violence prevention and public safety. 
So you all have given incredibly important insights. I'm gonna pick up on the last one for the question. So um, one of the topics we've been trying to grapple with today is how do we get more research or expert or analytical findings to actually influence policy? What are some of the incentive structures or disincentive structures that we should be advocating for? And so maybe I'll hone in just on, on Matt's last point. If focusing on the word terrorism is actually a part, is, is not necessarily helpful, what are ways in which we can be, as, as the research community, as the community of experts, be pushing forward on ways to do what is more helpful? Start at a local and state level. The fixation on, on these terms tends to be one that is within the beltway here. So for example, and by the way, there are parts of government, for example, the Department of Justice has programs for uh, evaluating programs and they're doing great work. But for example, in Massachusetts, the state uh, Department of Health and, and uh, Human Services has partnered with academics uh, at the state level to help drive some of their programs. Uh, a lot of state money, there might be some federal money, but this is being done at a more local level. So it doesn't all have to come out of Washington uh, for it to be effective and for it to then be available to be used by academics and others to then have conversations with policymakers uh, about how this can inform smart policymaking. I'm gonna reflect just slightly on that, which is, um, so the, the name of my title and many titles of, of those doing programs in this room and, and around in this community is Countering Violent Extremism, which I have a completely unscientific sample size that everybody hates this term. <laughs> so, yet it is the organizing principle on this phenomenon. I think there are a variety of different reasons as to why this term is um, alien to communities, it is not that helpful in actually describing the phenomenon, it's not the, the most popular um, term, but it is our organizing principle. And so to take what you were just saying, Matt, but maybe reflect on it a little bit further, um, if what we're trying to do is solve the challenge, hopefully, well, what can we do about the way in which we're conceptualizing it? And from the research perspective, are there ways to either study this or to give analysis or empirically based study about why we're sometimes uh, cutting off our nose to spite our face, even when the goals are good, but sometimes the ways and means may be challenged? Any thoughts? Um, what, wait, say that last part again. Um, <laughs> our, the last part was cutting off our nose to spite our face. Um, and so this was the idea that the goals of CVE are quite good, but perhaps the way in which we're describing it um, are. Yeah, I think, well, so I think, there. I'll know you can do research at many different levels, right? So um, uh, for me, oftentimes I'm doing research for very specific policy shops within the Department of Defense or Department of State. Um, not trying to influence like broad U.S. policy on all CVE issues, um, which you know, pretty cool. Matt's had a chance to do this like great bipartisan work for bipartisan committees. Where he has a chance to do that, but it's a so it's a very different type of topic. I think I think ultimately um, knowing your target audience, who are you doing this work for? Um, how are they going to use that work? Uh, being really integrated with the implementer. Um, or the policy maker so you can provide them the product they need. It's e really easy to provide research that misses the mark on many different levels. So I could do a study that for a specific policy shop, but my recommendations are very broad and generic. Well, that's not gonna help the policy shop. Um, I could do a work for broad, pol for broad policy goals, but I'm really too in the weeds. And sometimes the recommendations I'm making aren't even feasible on any real political level. So I think part of it is knowing the politics, what, what will be acceptable, what's not acceptable. You can shoot for the moon, but the moon's not always gonna get you where you wanna go. Um, and then you know, spending time and money and allocation to try and integrate those findings at the back end of it rather than just post your 100 page report up. <laughs> so I mean, really finding ways of talking to people and um, uh, communicating the, the results of what you're doing. Maybe that means using the word CVE, maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but there's many different types of questions that researchers need to deal with when they try and think about, is someone gonna actually use what I'm doing? Yeah. Um, I, I just have come out of, you know, really being embedded in thinking about 
practice when it comes to CVE, PVE, whatever we want to call it. And uh, in certainly in West Africa, where we we've been looking at lots of PVE, CVE projects, many don't call themselves that simply because that is a, it's it's a means for um, raising funds for what you think really needs to be done, which is peace building or conflict prevention. So it so very much aligns with that experience. I think in Africa our bigger problem is that there aren't resources being thrown at all those other things. Mm -hmm. So violence prevention, all of those other public safety issues. So there's a limited pot of money for what needs to be done. Um, there's a very interesting observation that came out of some of the work we've been doing recently around um, somebody um, commenting that, uh, and I think this was a comment from Niger, is that people don't ask us, and that aligns with your comments, uh, people don't ask us what we, they think Need, uh, we think needs to be done. We're dealing with a whole range of intergroup conflict, we're dealing with religious Christians versus Muslims over many years, maybe. We're dealing with a whole range of um, uh, ethnic um, difficulties between groups, um, nomadic groups and uh, settled groups. We're dealing with a whole range of criminal violence, uh, violence in homes. We're dealing with a mix of issues. And, the, and here you come along with some money and it's focused on violent extremism. Right? So now it's that little bit that we have to find our way through. And all those complexity of issues may relate to violent extremism as we say it and seem to know what we think we mean when we say it. But um, so it, it's this question of you know what is going on in those, those communities. And that's where I think the research matters. And, and, and the research, and, and I'm particularly talking about the practice of PVE now and CVE and, and changing things for people on the ground is that the research that you've done matters because we get an understanding of what, what people need, what the issues are. We don't assume that there's going to be violence on those campuses. Um, we find out about it, we develop programs, we, um, you know, this entire sort of continuum of activities that we need to do to build an evidence base. Um, that's the sort of thing we should be arguing for when we talk, we're talking to our donors. And we have a lot more influence on donors sometimes than others. Um, and, and possibly naming and shaming those donors that are not, um, and that are not really supportive of this agenda of g generating evidence that is useful for everybody. Um, so, you know, we're going to be raising it at our side event at uh, UNGA next week. Um, where we release this report. But one of the things we keep talking about is that is, is this a real thing we're talking about? Is this PBE something different? Is it, is it what you're talking about? Is it peace building? So if it is something different, then uh, let's figure out what is different about it and then hone in on those issues. Um, so um, I think that the, the, uh, the, the evidence building continuum, um, really we need to be, uh, I, I think, batting away at that uh, a lot more when it comes to uh, what we regularly say. And I see Emily smiling there because it is something that we talk about a lot and we say, um, I remember a conversation with Emily uh, earlier, Emily from Rusi, and we were, we were saying we were supportive skeptics of the idea, <laughs> but that as researchers we do have to be skeptical at these early stages yeah. when we really do not understand what this thing is about, but that as that develops, but it doesn't develop unless you invest in the research and the evaluation. So, um, yeah, I'll stop there. And imagine how difficult it, <clears throat> it is to convince policymakers when we are skeptics ourselves, which we need to be. <laughs> Just two quick comments on, on, on the CV terminology issue. One, I think we did it ourselves a tremendous disservice by failing early on to distinguish between CVE and PVE. 
They are different things. They include different things. Okay. Failing to do that led to a situation where everything was CVE. And we compounded that by making CVE the sexy thing and giving money to CVE and everybody wanted to be in CVE. And people described things they were already doing as CVE to get in on the CVE money. Uh, and suddenly CVE was everything from you know, off-ramping to building a playground in a, in a disadvantaged community, which is a misnomer of an example, a straw man, but you get the point. Um, the second point is this, and several of you in the room have heard me say it many before and you're, you're gonna laugh. I say it so often that my former research assistant got me a mug which sits on my desk which says, haters gonna hate. <laughs> the situation is such that there are people who are anti-CVE because they're anti-CVE. There are people who are, have been convinced that CVE is a cover for spying and I get that. But there are also people who are against it because they're just not interested in this because they're, they're, they're not trying to be a part of the solution. I've been doing this long enough uh, where I can spend a few minutes listing off for you all the different terminologies we've used for this in the past. Many people may not remember that CVE was the vanilla term that was intended to be the least mm. controversial. In other words, we're not dealing with extremism. That, you know, you can think whatever you want, but have you acted on it? So it's only violent extremism. Many people, myself included at the time, complained, look, if we're only dealing with violent extremism, then we're a dollar short and a day late. But it was meant to be more comforting. And CVE has become a term that is, yes, hated by a whole lot of people except State Department, which still has to use the term for congressionally <laughs> mandated financial reasons. Um, I still use the term too, because I don't think anything that, and that we've come up uh, as an alternative has been better, and I especially don't like the term terrorism prevention again, because it focuses wholly on terrorism, and frankly, if you're one of those people who was convinced that CVE was just a cover for police and counterterrorism, now you think that you were right. You've been vindicated. <laughs> and good CVE, certainly PVE, is not at all a cover for intelligence or law enforcement. Mm -hmm. For me, that really begs the question, though, because from an analysis point of view, from a research point of view, how are we able to, to adequately research certain situations if the way in which we're supposed to be doing it is for something that um, communities and others may find so abrasive? And I ask that because one of our speakers uh, earlier this afternoon is really talking about everyday peace indicators and how do we get this real indigenous understanding understanding of what what looks like a safe community, what looks like a secure community to you, community members. And if we as researchers are trying to showcase to policymakers um, some of those findings, what, what the positive trend lines look like from an analytical perspective, how do we do that under the moniker of uh, a term that, that is really difficult? So I mean, from my perspective, we've dealt, I've dealt with this a little bit. Rand, a few years ago, produced a report that, whether you like it or not, a lot of people hate it. Um, and, it and it dealt with sort of, quote, unquote, the moderate Muslim issue. And it sort of seemed to articulate what a moderate Muslim was and was not. And so it was perceived as identifying good Muslim, bad Muslim. Um, and so with that history, um, in comes Todd Helmus to go to the same people that are really p upset at RAN for doing this project, and I have to articulate that I'm not that guy. Um, and I think part of it is just relationship building. Um, Communities, uh, uh, certainly, as any community does, they have their per they have their perceptions, and some of those perceptions are right, and some are inherent, uh, some are wrong. And I think it's just a matter of building a relationship with them to overcome those issues, trying to address their concerns head on. Like, hey, listen, I know it. I know. I know what you're talking about, and that's not me. That's we're looking at something very different. Um, and help me, help me, help you. And let me carry water for you because part of our job is to is to do that. To doing good research requires uh, um, doing interviews and talking to people and understanding what their concern, issues and concerns are. And I think if you can show you can listen, then the terminology drops drops away very quickly. I mean, no one's gonna. I don't. Very few people are gonna continue to carry that water forever. Um, uh, once they get to know you, once they get to address your concerns, especially if you're doing it sort of in a real legitimate type of relationship perspective. Yeah, I think that um, uh, to the extent that you can build relationships 
uh, you can do a lot of good things. Um, and if you can demonstrate that what some people refer to as CVE, let me explain to you how we implement that. And the way, if you can explain, for example, at a, at a local level that you're implementing that through things like community policing and violence prevention, the types of things that parents care about for their children. You're not, I'm not coming to have a conversation with you because I think you're part of the terrorism problem, because this community, whatever this community is, is generating terrorists or could generate terrorists. Then you can overcome some of that. Um, it's difficult to overcome all of it because people are going to have to, you have to get people in the room in the first place. Um, and it gets to some of the metrics that, that we tend to get. It's not that they're bad metrics, they're not, it's just not necessarily truly CVE metrics. Maybe they're PVE metrics. Things like over a period of time, taking a poll of people who participate in these community engagements, uh, they get to things like what type of level of comfort do you have speaking with people from local government? Or if you had a problem, uh, would you approach someone or would you know who to approach? And we, we can improve those things through uh, uh, community engagements of different kinds. Uh, whether that is a true CVE metric is a conversation. Mm. It's also true though that if you can improve those types of metrics, you can get to a place where you can then talk about other things that can be more sensitive and can get to more CVE issues. Yeah. I'm going to pivot us slightly and ask a little bit more of a specific question. If um, if you all might share some examples from your experience of when you have seen um, research actually um, either change somebody's mind, change a policy, change a practice, um, if you've actually seen kind of have any anecdotes or examples of that kind of evidence-based shift. Um, uh, well, I, I Uncomfortable mumb <laughs> mumbling. Uh, uh. No, I, I think there, there are smaller examples, um, and this is in the days before um, alternative facts and facts are not facts, <laughs> and uh, and so on. You know, it's a, it, this dip, um, it relates to the earlier uh, conversation I was having about. Um, you know, trying to convince parliamentarians in the South African Parliament to pass juvenile justice legislation that was that was pretty liberal um, uh, uh, and liberal in the sense of treating kids through diversion uh, you know pretrial diversion a lot of alternative sentencing etc but we managed to use evidence to uh, to argue for something that was quite controversial at the moment anything to do with sex is controversial but um, young sexual offenders particularly um, the sexual offenses committed by young offenders was a, a big issue and we managed to argue them around purely based on international research and, and local research on this. Um, but I think that um, there are several um, examples also of practice driving policy and not the other way around. Um, and these are two, also two examples from South Africa and uh, again my juvenile justice example, criminal justice examples. Uh, but um, you know, in order to uh, enable um, diversion to be considered an acceptable part of a, a juvenile justice system, this means pre-trial diversion. Kids who have committed offences, admitted to the, committing those offences, mostly non-violent offences, being allowed to not be prosecuted based on an agree agreement to do some programs or to mm -hmm. apologize or whatever. So uh, pre-trial diversion was never part of the system. We used um, in South Africa, and, and luckily being part of a national organization, used the, the idea that, that prosecutors had discretion over these things and convinced each director of public prosecutions of nine different provinces that this was okay to try and let's try it in a few courts. By the time it actually came to legislating over it, we had it operating in 20 different jurisdictions and really had data on the fact that those kids who, uh, you know, a, a minor number of them, 5% of something re-offended. Mm -hmm. So um, practice drove, and, and similarly, South Africa implemented um, alternative sentences, um, community-based sentencing around community service, community service orders as an alternative to imprisonment um, as a sentence, um, and it was in practice long before 
uh, it was actually in legislation. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes um, if it's, you know, th these are just lucky circumstances because we were able to have little loopholes to work with. Uh, but also um, is that I think that um, we need to think upside down as well a little bit because the successful examples have come from practice driving policy uh, and not waiting to get now, our the problem in Africa is it takes so long to, to to make policy that you might as well try and put things into practice first to get it done <laughs> and maybe the policy will come along later. Here in the United States policy making is quick and smooth. It's <laughs> <laughs> You're so like um, so uh, in 2007, we came out with a report uh, arguing for population-centric counterinsurgency in Iraq. And uh, lo and behold, the following year, there's a population-centric counterinsurgency strategy. So I myself thought I must have had something to do with this. Um, because, you know, the report got some press, the right people must have seen it, certainly General Petraeus read it. Um, finally, when I was doing my advisory work in, Af in Iraq, I had the chance um, to, to meet Petraeus and it became quite obvious he'd never read my report. And, and it, and, but to this day, my brother-in-law thinks that I was behind the surge. Um, <laughs> It's, so, I mean, even when you think you have an effect, you really don't know. The policy process can take like a long time to follow through. I know there's at least a couple instances when we seem to have good luck, and these happen to be in the military side. And if you get a chance to do military research, it's kind of nice because a decision maker, the decision making process, especially in a deployed environment, is pretty straightforward. The commander wants to do something, the commander generally can do something. So if he likes what you do, there's options. And if you get to know the system, you get to know who is reading and who can use the stuff you're doing. So we did work on uh, survey, opinion survey research and on an operational template that the special operations folks were doing that I've heard from multiple sources um, helped to validate that operational approach because it just demonstrated that it wasn't upsetting the populations like people thought they were. So that's a rare chance. I get the feed, got the feedback from the policymakers, and I saw the subsequent reports citing our work like, oh, okay, so that made a difference. Um, and that's so, I think the, the lesson for me, there's a lot of value in doing evaluation work. If you can do evaluation work on ongoing efforts, ongoing operations, ongoing CVE programs, there's such a need for that, there's such a hunger for results there, that it's almost guaranteed that if you do it well, you're gonna, you're gonna help make a difference either by showing that the program's worth doing or not worth doing. Mm -hmm. Um, the other piece that we did was recognizing that our audience was not necessarily the commander, it was the guys on the ground. The E5s, um, the special operations teams working in very forward deployed areas. And so we did a report looking at best practices, like interviewed a number of folks, how can you best run these types of operations in the future? Um, the commander had no use to the commander. Um, but we found that folks were transitioning that around for de pre deployment training over and over and over again. And years later, this piece that was never published, just a PDF document, had really made the rounds. So there again, it was like thinking our target audience of, in that case, knowing the target audience was going to be guys who were really motivated to learn something before going um, to Afghanistan, um, and that they would be uh, suitable audiences for this. And I think, not that you can just do a, go do research for like special operations guys going down range, but know who your audience is, how they're going to use it, um, and you can frame your report in ways that can be most useful to them. And it doesn't always have to be a decision maker or Congress. <laughs> Um, it could be others that could learn from it. And then the outcomes are much softer. There's not like a major change that happens after a briefing, like, oh, okay, Todd, now we're gonna do all of that stuff. That never happens. <laughs> um, it's much more softer than that, and you, you gotta look for the cues. You gotta let me leave work at the end of the day and assume that everybody's read my product and is taking my advice. Otherwise, <laughs> it's hard to, hard to write it. I'll give, you, I'll give you three examples. <clears throat> Two positive, one not. Uh, first, uh, you, you had a judge in Minneapolis who decided, based on the research of a German researcher uh, who started his work on, on hate groups and moved into uh, terrorism, uh, on levels of radicalization, uh, to uh, start in his sentencing to uh, include alternative dispositions. Uh, this was controversial. Uh, it gets back into my earlier comment about how uh, we don't have a political system that uh, is willing to uh, take a lot of risk. Um, but the other thing that was interesting about this and remains an issue today is that um, this has not been done across the board. 
So this is still one, one judge. Uh, and if you talk to prosecutors uh, in different jurisdictions across the country, uh, people are, were left feeling like, well, you know, someone in Minneapolis got an alternative disposition in a halfway house for a year and then a lifetime supervision maybe, uh, but in another jurisdiction is gonna get 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily consistent across the board, but you had real research that had a real impact on not just policy, but on, on people's lives and led is continuing to lead to a real policy discussion. Uh, another is, um, the uh, debate as to what the na biggest nature of the threat is here in the United States and, and whether that includes uh, what we widely, uh, broadly refer to as, as domestic terrorism, white supremacists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the ADL and some other groups came out with a series of studies that I think really quite definitively demonstrated that the number of incidents, attacks, thwarted attacks, et cetera, uh, number of people killed or injured by just about every metric, um, there was a greater threat from what you would describe as domestic terrorists here in the United States. Not to say that we don't have to be concerned about international terrorism, we obviously do, but that uh, if you leave politics at the door, um, the reality in the ground was a little different. An area where uh, uh, research hasn't really had quite as much of an impact, and that's because it's high, high policy, uh, is on the debate as to whether or not um, immigration and illegal immigration, separate or together, are a major counterterrorism problem. Are the majority of incidents of terrorist uh, attacks or plots in the United States by people who came here from abroad legally or illegally. Um, there are some in this administration who push that line very, very hard. Uh, I've written about it several times now, pushing against it, and there's a tremendous amount of very, very strong data. The data is unanimous that this is not the case, uh, that, that this is not an immigration problem. Immigration is a third rail hot potato right now, and therefore it hasn't had, uh, the research hasn't had the impact, but that's because of the, because of the specific and unique circumstances of this particular hot potato issue. It's many, many times. <laughs> In fact, I had uh, an article come out about it um, after the uh, vehicular attack in Manhattan on Halloween. Um, the article came out the morning that I was speaking on a, one of the opening panels at an NCTC conference on what we were then referring to as, as CVE. Um, and got pulled aside by a whole bunch of people saying, well, okay, not necessarily uh, with a thumbs up, but your thing is getting a lot of attention, which was great. That's why I wrote it, to not necessarily make people happy, but to, to, but to prompt that discussion. Got a lot of attention in the broader community, sure. Uh, the broader and the Twitterverse community is not the same as high policy, uh, and uh, with some ex <laughs> critical exceptions. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if that, <laughs> Policymaker side. <laughs> but I, I do think these voices contribute to high policy. If not now, then maybe eventually. Yeah. Um, so even if there's not like that direct policy result, I mean to be able to change the conversation, to be able to influence the conversation, to be able to be a part of the conversation that's evolving, I think is um, a real special opportunity to to be a part of that. Um, and so I think those are, those are wins even if you're still waiting for the high policy to change because I think um, the, the wins are going in that direction if not now then later. I think these are all interesting um, points for us all to consider as the future of research and you know research for research sake, research for influencing policy, research for influencing practice and all the different permutations in between. So um, you have all mentioned in some way, shape or form monitoring and evaluation and I'd love to kind of pull the thread a little bit more as to how monitoring and evaluation findings can be influential. and if there are meaningful benefits between kind of um, research for more, research for research sake and research for in the monitoring evaluation vein, and if maybe we can pull a, a little bit more nuance in um, those type of findings and how, um, how they might be um, stratified meaningfully or if not stratified then, um, then used in an ecosystem where we're trying to, to take multiple <coughs> pieces of information to make better decisions. 
<laughs> Look, I, when Jesse spoke this morning, he put a slide up there quoting uh, General Nagata from NCTC. Um, that line was from a, an event that I hosted. I was sitting on the dais with him, as he said, you know, uh, to something to the effect of, you know, we still don't know what, what drives these things. And I, uh, I said to General Nagata after the fact that I disagree. Um, we don't know everything, but we actually, we actually know a lot. Again, I've been doing this for long enough that, you know, that can tell you how many rooms of size we can fill with these studies, classified and unclassified both, that we've been doing over the years about all these issues. What we need are not more studies. What we need is programs that are being evaluated to see if they are actually having the type of impacts we want. Um, and we can put those programs in place because we have a decent understanding of the very, very, very broad waterfront of issues that can lead to radicalization from grievances to ideology and everything in between. There are now a handful of programs that have gone through some pretty good MINE, and that's great, but we need more so that when people like me go to members of Congress saying, hey, we, we need to put in place programs like these, and they say, well, how will I know they're gonna work? Why should I fund them in the first place? You can say, well, because we've, we've done some things, we've measured some things, here's what we can tell you from what we can tell works in certain circumstances. We need that evidence base. We need that ammunition to be able to get the ball rolling. The most difficult thing is getting it rolling at all. But I think we've done that now. Uh, again, there's, there's, there's a good program at the Department of Justice that has been um, uh, funding evaluation of programs in different parts of the country. Um, it's not like we're starting at ground zero, uh, but we need a lot more of metrics and evaluations of actual programs, not another study saying the role of ideology or the, ro the, mm. the role of grievance and another pyramid and, mm. okay, we've got plenty of these, okay? Now tell me if the different types of programs we put in place to address different touch points on that waterfront or on that pyramid are, are having the intended effect. I, I agree that the, the, the real space to, to, for us to focus now is on producing good m and &E, and that means producing good research right at the front end of programs and being able to measure uh, the effects of those. But I, I think that we're not appropriately structured and funded in order to do that yet. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the advocacy we need to do um, around the way m and &E is funded. For example, the, the duration of funding, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the timelines required to achieve some of these things. You know, the violence prevention people will tell you the timelines. They're sometimes 15 years and intergenerational uh, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. So um, the timelines are not aligned with the actual funding available. And, and so there are a number of technical problems in terms of program design, what's, how evaluation is funded, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then whether you're producing monitoring and evaluation data. So um, the second piece of this is, of course, communicating it and communicating it to who for what reason. Um, so let's just say we want to scale up this program and we want to do it somewhere else. We want to take the principles and maybe try them somewhere else. And I, I hate the idea of replication of programs, but uh, especially in the context I come from. Uh, but um, you know, if you want to take some principles and try them elsewhere, why why we're doing the ME is to show that maybe the program works or some principles work. But I think the, the biggest problem, and uh, it's a bizarre, silly thing that we keep doing, is communicating badly and, and not communicating in a way that people can really understand <coughs> the value of what we've done or the lack of value of what we've done um, and, and what has worked and what hasn't worked. And, and packaging that communication in a way that people can really understand it. So the 100-page report is required. 
and, and uh, it certainly is required, it sits on our websites because we do need the technical work to be done. However, um, you know, the repackaging of that information, um, we actually treat some of that information now as we've reviewed our entire communications approach as an organization the last four years, is actually um, tweeting out research findings <laughs> from reports and having uh, those be retweeted by policymakers. Yay! <laughs> I mean, if that, if that happens, you know, uh, so, so doing that as a, as a means and then also um, reaching policymakers in Africa is actually about getting your stuff into the media and getting your, uh, and, and social media now. So, uh, so putting those short little stories into the media, trying to get people to interview you and to cultivate journalists and so on. Uh, because um, policymakers are not listening to us as researchers, they may be reading the newspaper, um, and in, it is the paper, and radio and television. So, um, yeah, let me leave it to that. I'll just, uh, we're really short in time, I'll just add in, I think the tide has turned on this. Mm. I think there's an increasing understanding um, that evaluations are needed uh, for these types of things. Um, they've been sorely missing in the past. I think that there's value in doing evaluations on many different levels. If you are running your own CVE program, there's no reason at all you shouldn't collect your own data to, uh, mm. to see whether or not you're producing the type of effect you're doing. There's many benefits to it. It's much more than just being able to go to your funder and say, ah, I see I'm working, give me more money. <laughs> It's, I mean, the evaluations are really critical for programmers to improve their own programming. Mm. Are there certain types or audience, certain types of their audience that are responding well, not responding well? If they're not responding well, you can figure it out early and change your program so they do respond well. So it's, it's not just to be able to have an up or down vote on is it good or bad. It's to actually improve your programming, and so that's really valuable. Um, but of course, um, I think there's real value in also doing real academically sound research on this. We're, we're, this is a new year for me. We're doing a lot of this type of work. In fact, we're doing several clinical trials on CVE programming, so, um, uh, which is a sort of a different level. It's a different price tag to that, of course, than handing out some questionnaires to your participants. It's not cheap. It's expensive to do. Um, but if, I think if an implementer is like spending, if a government agency is spending a lot of money on a program, um, then they should need to spend a, a chunk of a chunk of money on an evaluation, and it probably should be an independent evaluation. So I'm going to stay on that last point. Um, how I think that I'm so in agreement that the m and movement has been really, really useful on the idea that programs have to be evaluated and has to be built in from the outset and that, um, that we need to be doing more of this. I wonder how we do that in um, ecosystems that are so atomized by the stovepipe after efforts that happen, whereas you only can see impact from um, a plethora of different efforts all at once. And so to me, some of the work for the academic community and for more external research is to look at an entire system while some of the m and &E is going to be project level, program level. Um, but it kind of gets to your point, Cheryl, how do we do this on the time horizon where you can actually see something? And I was at a lunch uh, earlier um, last, I think it was either this week or last week where somebody said, um, it's very difficult to know what whether you're in a trend or a cycle when you're in it. <laughs> um, because cycles look like trends until you're out of it. And it struck me as something that could be you know, very applicable to a lot of our work. How do we get that kind of meta level of analysis? How do we maximize what can be an outside look at research and combine lots of program level or project level inputs together to see what's actually happening? Because there is an idea that you can have many successful programs but not actually be seeing a successful ecosystem change or impact change because external environmental factors are changing at a more rapid pace than any of your interventions are addressing. So can we talk a little bit about how we can get to that kind of meta level from the researching perspective? Um, I, I'll do my two cents on that. Is I, to me, that's like, it makes it too hard. To, mm. to pose the issue like that. That assumes that your outcome, the dependent measure of your evaluation is less terrorism, more terrorism. Yeah, can't do it. You're probably not gonna be able to do that evaluation. Um, you're never gonna be able to randomize enough people to find out if some people actually committed terrorist attacks and some didn't. Um, even showing changes in attitudes, do it if you can, but it can be hard. 
So to our view, the, really, the key goal is interim outcomes. Um, what, what, no program just blindly, yes, our goal is to reduce terrorism and that's our program. That's, nobody has that program. The program are always have near-term interventions. Is it to help socially stabilize at-risk at youth, give them social networks? Is it to um, uh, uh, provide meaningful job opportunities to people coming out of prison so they have alternative actions to do rather than resort to a life of crime or maybe even violent extremism? So in generally, CV programs try to do something that get that is an interim objective to their big pan panacea outcome, and that's where the evaluations I think need to occur. Um, that is, uh, um, and those can be done in a short-term horizon. So if you have a program that seeks to work with at-risk youth to give them social outlets, does it increase social outlets? You can test that in a very short period of time, and if it doesn't, then your program's not going to work. Um, and it's probably not going to have the long-term outcome you think it will have because your long-term outcome is dependent on the short-term outcome. So I think that's sort of the key goal is to, is to shorten the, limit your goals and objectives on your evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, can I also just say that, the, you know, the, the um, yeah, it's a difficult question to, uh, uh, but you know, other fields have been doing this for a long time. Mm. Um, criminal violence prevention, it's a field that exists for more than 40 years. They have 40 years of evidence of learning of, te of techniques and strategies and um, in order to, to try and figure out contribution, attribution, all of that technical stuff, which is boring but does need to be, <laughs> I mean, we do need to engage with it as if we want to do M&E. Um, I think Th those 40 years for them, and it really does, uh, y y we can, I mean, they can demonstrate some evidence-based practices that have worked in Japan as well as they've, they've worked under similar circumstances in New York City, and they've worked under similar circumstances somewhere in Sweden. And <laughs> uh, so, you know, they, they've come really far in terms of their evidence base and this building of evidence-based practices that may work in your area for a particular thing. So um, I, I don't think it's impossible to do any of this, but we're, we're at such an early stage in this in this field that it's really difficult to, to try to pull it apart. One of their biggest problems, and, and I have colleagues who work in this field at the moment, is this business of scaling things up, right? Mm -hmm. So you may have a, a fantastic project that has shown that you can actually reduce terrorism in, uh, or violent extremism somewhere in the world, and, and it's really um, the, the, the issue is how do you scale things up un, un, unless you can get government to legislate and fund it fully you know, in one go. And that, um, that process is something that that field is still struggling with, um, notwithstanding the massive amounts of evidence that may exist around that. So again, it's that conversation between what is this complication between evidence and policy? Mm. And, and, and why is it, and it's different all over, all over the world. Um, every context has its own issues, um, and it's mostly the politicians that are the, that are the problem, <laughs> not us. <laughs> um, but really, it is, it is a big puzzle, and we have to figure it out for ourselves in each indiv individual case, I think. Yeah. I can only add that, um, to me, what the biggest part of the problem is everything that you both said makes all the sense in the world, except if you're a policymaker. Right, the policymaker isn't yeah. interested in what's going to happen in the near, they want to know how is this, my, my goal actually is to defeat terrorism. Mm. I can't tell you how often, still to this day, I get asked, well, well when is terrorism going to end? I'm a terrorist, <laughs> have you stopped? It, it, anyway, yeah, exactly, how many terrorists have you stopped? <laughs> um, look, you know, when, when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence at Treasury in a different area in, in terror finance issues, we had similar problems with uh, finding methodologically sound uh, um, information to demonstrate that the monies we were 
uh, getting were actually stemming the flow of funds and uh, improving the uh, security of the international financial system. And so we did uh, the methodologically unsound and politically wise thing of declassifying a small number of incidents and, and stringing them into a testimony. Uh, not methodologically sound, but people would be able to go forward and say, look, here, here are some successes we've had. And so the problem is, is not, Todd, that you're wrong, you're absolutely right. It's just the, 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 when you translate this into trying to affect policymakers' decision making, um, that's the barrier because they want to know something beyond that. And then, you know, your, your point about criminal justice, absolutely. But because terrorism has been put in its own box, you know, I get told all the time, look, oh, but, but crime is something different. Gangs is something different. All these things that we could learn from suicide prevention is something different. I'm not saying that terrorism is the exact same thing as gangs or suicide prevention or, or, or uh, crime, but there are things from each of those areas that we can learn from. There's a lot of study that's been done in each of these areas that is useful to us. And frequently policymakers don't want to make use for that because for political reasons, uh, this, terrorism is seen as something different. Mm. And, and I think it's just a matter of an insufficient amount of resilience. We usually talk about societal resilience. I think there's a whole political and policy resilience that is lacking, that is having a really negative impact on our ability to leverage the research that's been done already in a Venn diagram kind of way. What, this is separate, but there's a piece of it that's relevant mm. and we are not able to use that because so many people insist that all those other things are something completely different. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is the moment where I get to uh, pat the Resolve Network on the back because during our discussions, breakout sessions, that all of you were a part of one of the um, areas on that kind of sticky notes uh, framework where what are other areas that we should be learning from as the CVE community of practice? And I know at the tables that I got a chance to sit with, uh, there were a lot of different areas that I think we can learn a lot from. And if we are committed to elevating the empiricism, the rigor, and the knowledge base on this problem set. We have to be learning from other um, areas, not in the, this is the exact same thing, but there may be some extrapolatable lessons, and also there may be some non-extrapolatable lessons, things that are absolutely different, and we can be learning from that as well. Those are no less important. Yeah, so with that, um, we are out of time. I'd love to thank my colleagues and co-panelists for this last discussion. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all.